Listening comprehension is not only about extracting information from the spoken Mandarin you hear, it's also about applying what you already know and expect. Hello and welcome to the Hacking Chinese podcast. In this week's episode we are going to continue our discussion about listening comprehension and this is a series called Beyond Tingbudong. And so the idea here is that instead of just saying Timbudong, I don't understand, we go beyond that and explore why you might not understand something and what you can do about it. This is episode 3 in this series, and if you want to check out episodes 1 and 2, which I strongly recommend, you should check out episodes 111 and 112. In the first episode in this series, we talked about listening comprehension in general, so it's a kind of overview and introduction to the whole series. And then in the second episode, we talked about bottom-up processing, which is about extracting information from the spoken language that you hear. So you identify speech sounds, you combine them into syllables, you associate the syllables with words and so on, so gradually you build up to some kind of comprehension, bottom-up. At first glance, listening comprehension seems to be about extracting information from spoken language. And that is indeed part of it, but speech never contains all the information necessary to make sense of it, so in order to understand, we need to rely on prior knowledge. The most obvious type of knowledge is probably knowledge about the language itself. So it goes without saying that we need certain information about the language, about the sounds, and about what words mean and how grammar functions and so on, in order to make sense of what somebody says. That is only one type of knowledge that's necessary for successful listening, however. Listening is, in fact, a very active process where we constantly seek to make sense of what's being said in light of what has already been said, what we know about the situation, and what we expect the other person to say. One way of looking at it is to say that listening comprehension is about reconciling information gleaned from the spoken language with what we already know. Let's use English to show you an example of what I mean here. So, have you ever wondered why words pronounced the same way but with different meanings, i.e. homonyms, aren't confused more often? So, in English, for example, we have three words that are all pronounced there. So, we have there as in over there, we have there as in their house, and we have there as in they are. And they are pronounced the same way, but they clearly mean completely different things and are also used differently in spoken language. This hardly ever causes the slightest bit of problem, however, at least not for native speakers. And this is because the language isn't only processed from the bottom up. We don't only listen to the sounds and notice that these are the same, but we also process the language from the other direction, i.e. top down. So we know which word meaning to activate, not just based on the sounds that we hear, but also what fits into the sentence we just heard. If you hear someone say, I want to go, hmm, You know that it's there as in over there, because none of the other there words actually fit in this sentence. And you know this without even listening to what the person says. Well, obviously they could say something completely different, I mean a different word, but if it's something that sounds like this, you can be reasonably sure it is there as in over there and not one of the others. So let's look at an example of this we have talked about before on the podcast, but from Mandarin this time. So we have a pair of words that are often used to illustrate the importance of tones. So if you're at the zoo and you say that the xiong mao uh, are very cute, people will understand that you meant the pandas, not someone's chest hair. So to clarify, these words are identical except for the tones. So here, their prior knowledge and conceptual framework of what you might say makes panda a much more likely word even though, of course, the correct pronunciation is xiong mao, with a rising tone followed by a high tone. This is an example of a more general principle that says that the more predictable something you're going to say is, the less accurate you need to be. And the reason for that is, of course, that the listener can rely on things outside of the things you actually say, such as the situation or something else. I spent an entire episode talking about this, so I'll put a link in the description to that. In this episode, though, we are going to explore the top-down processes involved in listening comprehension. So if bottom-up processing is like using bricks to build a house, synthesizing comprehension from the smallest units, top-down processing is like using a blueprint when building, relying on what you already comprehend to make sense of what you hear later. In the previous episode in this series, we discussed three steps, and those were perception, parsing, and utilization. 
And none of those work on their own, they are all reliant on top-down processing as well. Let's review quickly what these steps are and how prior knowledge and top-down processing can help with each. So the first step we looked at was perception, and that is about identifying cues in the spoken language which are relevant for Mandarin. So for example, we can use tone height and how it changes over time to identify tones or other acoustic features to identify initials and finals. But for this to work, we need to rely on prior knowledge about Mandarin in particular. Step two was parsing, and this is about connecting the speech sounds identified in the perception step to the meaning of words stored in long-term memory. And as I just said, this obviously requires these words and expressions to already be in long-term memory, so that is a directly a kind of prior knowledge. The third step, utilization, is where understanding of the spoken language occurs. Words, expressions and structures identified in the parsing step are combined to a meaningful whole, which also involves matching what we hear with what we know, expect and think about the situation, enabling us to interpret and understand what's being said on a higher level. For this to work properly, we need extensive knowledge not just about the language used, but we also need to know about the situation, human interaction and the world around us in general. Since we're looking at this from the opposite end this time, let's reverse the order and talk about utilization first. As was the case last time, this is built on a model by Van de Grift 2011, and I provided links to references in the written article on Hacking Chinese. Most of the actual information about the cognitive aspects of listening comprehension in this episode and the previous one comes from Van de Grift and Go 2012 and Rost 2011, although I have tried to adapt as much as possible to make the discussion relevant specifically for learners of Mandarin. If you want to see a visual representation of Van de Grift's model, I've put an image in the written article on Hacking Chinese, but I'll do my best to make it comprehensible in podcast format as well. At first, it might seem a little bit weird that we need a lot of prior knowledge to make sense of what someone is saying. You'd think that the information needed to interpret what someone says is actually in the message itself, but this is not the case. We often take this prior knowledge for granted, which is why we don't think about it too much. Unless, of course, we're learning a second language when it becomes pretty obvious. So, to begin with, in order to be able to interpret not just the literal meaning, but also the intended message, we need to take context into account. This is why teachers, and reasonable native speakers, often want you to give more context before they feel they can answer a question about what something means. They don't demand context to annoy students, even though I know it can feel like that sometimes. Some of that context is of course provided in the spoken language itself, and it is often enough. For example, if you're listening to a longer explanation of something, or following a conversation on TV, you'll often have to rely on what was said earlier to understand what's being said now. This is not surprising, as it can be difficult to understand our native language if we're thrown into an unfamiliar conversation, for example. Context is not limited to the spoken language itself, however, but can also include things such as where you are, what's happening around you, who the speaker is, what their facial expression is like, and so on. A good example of this is watching a movie versus listening to an audio drama. For most learners, the former is considerably easier than the latter, and that's because in a movie, much of what we need in terms of context is shown on screen. We don't need Chinese to access that information. In a radio play, however, there's nothing to look at, and any contextual information necessary to make sense of what's being said has to be conveyed through spoken Chinese only. Audiobooks is an even clearer example of this. Now, it might seem that the more information we provide when we speak, the easier it will be to understand, so the more we say the better, or the more information we include the better. But this is not really the case, because spoken language rather strives towards being efficient rather than being just wordy. So in essence, this means that we need to say only as much as is necessary to make the other person understand, but not so little that we are unclear. The problem when learning a second language is, of course, that this varies between listeners, and that non-native speakers often don't know things that native speakers take for granted and just assume that the listener will know. Efficiency is actually one of Paul Grice's maxims, i.e. principles that we intuitively follow to facilitate conversations. It ideally states that we try to be informative, but not more than necessary. Consider the case of asking the way to the nearest metro station in Chinese. We could imagine a few different types of answers. Answer number one. Just keep walking. 
Answer number two. Keep walking, turn right at the next intersection. Then when you reach Da Anson Lin Gong Yuan, turn left and you'll see the station ahead of you. Answer number three. Keep walking on the pavement instead of in the middle of the road, because there are cars there, which are wheeled vehicles that move quickly, so if you're hit by one, you might get injured or even killed. When you get to the next intersection, which has three lanes in each direction, remember to use the zebra crossing, which is an area with white stripes painted on the road to indicate that you should cross there. Turn left and walk 283 meters until you reach Da An Sun Lin Gong Yuan, which is a 259,293 square meter area with trees and a lake. Then turn left and you'll see the station ahead of you. The first answer contains too little information. Technically it's true that you can just keep walking and you'll get there, but since it doesn't include information about where to turn, it is not very helpful. It violates the maximum of quantity by not including enough information. The second answer is closer to what we consider a helpful and appropriate answer, but note that it assumes that you know some things. If you're new in town, you might not know what Da An Sun Lin Gong Yuan is, and might not be able to recognize it if you're unable to decode the name in Chinese. If you don't know, the name might refer to anything, so while the instructions would be super clear for most native speakers, it might be impossible to understand for a foreign student. The third answer is clearly too verbose, including lots of information that is either irrelevant or can be assumed that the listener already knows. Anybody asking this question will know what a zebra crossing is, and be aware of the dangers of being hit by a car, and the extra information about the park might be interesting, but not relevant. The point is that the speaker's idea of what the listener knows might be incorrect. It is after all hard to know what a foreigner knows and doesn't know, and even harder to examine what prior information is required to make sense of what one says. If you're listening to someone who isn't speaking directly to you, such as if you watch a movie or listen to a podcast, the speaker doesn't even know who you are and so can't adjust the amount of information to include even if they wanted to. In some cases, we might have the knowledge necessary to make sense of something, but it's hidden below a layer of superficial differences, such as accent and different ways of naming the same thing. A good example of this is foreign names in Chinese. So if someone refers to the famous Seilo, you don't understand, whereas if they would have said Cristiano Ronaldo, you would understand. This is something we explored further in episode 44, Lost in Transcription, Seilo, Ice Island and Aristotle. So in summary, we have three kinds of prior knowledge that are relevant in the utilization step. The first one is pragmatic knowledge, and this is about words used in real-world contexts, including circumlocution, euphemisms, figurative language, politeness, and much more. For learners of Mandarin, this includes knowing that ni chilema can be used as a greeting more than a question, and that if somebody says no, they might actually mean yes, and sometimes when people say yes, it's just a polite way of saying no. The second type of knowledge is discursive knowledge, which is about the structure of the conversation in a specific context. So for example, a phone call follows a certain pattern, and so do conversations with staff immediately after entering a restaurant. These are also different between different cultures, and assuming the wrong structure will make it hard to understand what's being said. And this is why trying out your Chinese in a completely new setting can be unexpectedly hard, even if you know the words and grammar needed. A good example of this is visiting a night market without having any clue about how to buy certain types of food. So in some restaurants you pay first, you then get the food. In other restaurants you're supposed to grab something yourself, do something and then pay. And there are dozens of different ways of doing this, and if you don't know anything about how this works, understanding the instructions someone gives you will be hard if you have no framework for how to do this specific activity. The third type of knowledge is world knowledge, and this is information about the world we live in. A good example of this is knowing that Da An Sun Ning Gong Yuan is a big park in Taipei, or knowing what a pop culture reference in TV is about, or being able to link Sei Luo to Cristiano Ronaldo, and knowing who he is, of course. So while this is not strictly part of listening itself, this information is vital for comprehension, and once you reach a more advanced level, most failures in comprehension comes from not having enough background knowledge. So we have now looked at some cases where prior knowledge is required to make sense of spoken language, but this is not the only way top-down processing is important. 
Our evolving understanding of a situation can also be directly used to guide and support both perception and parsing. So one way of looking at it is to say that since we have an outline already, it becomes much easier to identify the right building blocks and figure out where to put them. For example, if a word meaning that you have activated in the parsing step does not fit in your conceptual framework of the situation, you might surmise that something went wrong in the perception step. Maybe you thought that someone was selling their house, my, but when they start complaining about the high price, you can repair your perceptual error and realize that they are probably buying a house, my. You misheard the tone and activated the wrong word, but your understanding of the situation helped you fix the problem. The example I mentioned at the beginning with Xiong Mao and Xiong Mao at the zoo is a similar case. And I discussed more such cases in tone errors in Mandarin that actually can cause misunderstandings, and I'll put a link in the show notes. Corrections like these can be a conscious process, as I described above, a form of problem solving, but it's usually subconscious and happens all the time. The brain tries to figure out what words might be the right ones, and does so based on all the information available, eliminating candidates whose meanings seem irrelevant or that don't fit the available data. This is of course how we are able to tell the difference between words that are pronounced the same way without even noticing that we do so. When you hear they're selling their house over there, you don't stop to think about which word is which, even though the three there are pronounced the same way. In our native language, we're very good at top-down processing, which means that we don't need to rely as much on bottom-up processing. If you call a friend and the audio quality is bad, you can often still have a conversation even though you certainly can't identify all the sounds and might even miss entire words. This is because you know enough about the topic of the conversation, what has already been said, who your friend is, and so on, to be able to fill in all the gaps. I recently had a conversation with my brother over the phone in Swedish, and even though he was on the metro and the connection was so bad that I only heard every other word, I could still understand what he wanted to say. This would have been completely impossible without heavy use of top-down processing, which happened completely naturally and without me thinking about it at the time. I only thought of this afterwards when writing the draft of the article that this episode is based on. This doesn't really work when listening to low-quality audio in a foreign language, however, where even the slightest distortion can throw you off completely. I once sat a TOCFL exam in a classroom with so much echo that I hardly understood anything, even though the language was well within my capacity to understand. Announcements in busy train stations are the worst, of course. Apart from the higher level forms of knowledge we have mostly focused on so far, we also need to rely on knowledge about the language itself to be able to process it. We already discussed this in the previous article, but to summarize briefly, we need phonological knowledge to be able to identify phonemes, tones, intonation, stress, and how they vary in context. We also need semantic knowledge, which is about the meaning of words. This can be tricky because Chinese has so few words in common with English. When learning closely related languages, we can rely on similar words we already know in another language, greatly facilitating and speeding up parsing. People who haven't tried to learn a truly foreign language seldom appreciate how much of a difference this makes. Understanding spoken French is not the same thing as understanding spoken Mandarin if you're a native speaker of English. Finally, we also need syntactic knowledge or knowledge about the grammar and structure of Mandarin. Considering that there are so many similar sounding words in Mandarin, it's especially important to be able to discard word candidates because of their function in a sentence, as we saw in the English example with the three there. If only one word fits grammatically into the sentence you hear, you can ignore other similar sounding words. Or your brain can do it for you, because of course you are normally not aware that this is happening. One thing that fascinates me about the things I've discussed in this series so far is that even though the real process is much more convoluted and complicated than I have explained here, all this still happens at the pace of naturally spoken language, or at least that's what happens when you're able to understand what someone is saying. So in that sense it's rather amazing that we are able to understand what people say at all, and especially in a foreign language. The reason this works is mostly that processing is highly automated, meaning that we've been doing it so many times that it takes no conscious effort or attention. 
That doesn't mean that attention is unimportant though, and you can aid processing somewhat by directing your attention. This will be covered in more detail in some of the upcoming episodes, but just to mention one example, activating prior information can be done consciously and can speed up processing significantly. So in other words, simply thinking about what people might say in a given situation will activate the parts of the brain where this knowledge is stored, and thus when you later hear someone talk about this, processing is sped up. Similarly, directing your attention to contextual clues, you can aid top-down processing, which will make it easier to form a prototype of what the speaker wants to convey, which in turn will support your ability to discern sounds and identify words. You will not always be correct, and you will sometimes need to backtrack and revise your model, but top-down processing like this is crucial for listening comprehension. In the next episode in this series, which will likely be published two weeks from now, we will talk more about automated and controlled processing, where the former can deal with many things at once and happen subconsciously, and the latter only deal with one thing at a time, but is controlled by the listener. As usual, for visual representations of the models I've talked about today, as well as references and further reading, please check out the written article on Hacking Chinese. Thank you for tuning in to the Hacking Chinese podcast. If you like this episode, please share it. More information and inspiration about learning and teaching Chinese can be found at hackingchinese.com. See you in the next episode, and until then, good luck with your studies.